special guests. With us we have Professor Gabriel Patan, who is a Waziri of Education for Dominican County. And he has brought with us uh, the first uh, elected women's uh, a woman in the uh, MCA. And she's of Mwawesa Ward, Rabbi Sub County. And her name is Carol Kalume. And we're very, very honored. We're very, very pleased to have these guests with us. We also have with us uh, our teacher advisor. His name is Mr. Gersonga from Jumani Secondary. And uh, he has been very good in helping us through these holidays. As you can see around me, we have children who are here today studying. Um, we're still in the middle of April holidays, and they're going to be getting ready to go back to school in a couple of days. Today, they have an opportunity to ask some questions, and I'm going to hand over to Max, our moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, today we're joined with uh, two special guests and uh, Mr. C.S. So we may start. Uh, congratulations, first of all, uh, for the appointment uh, as a cabinet secretary for education. And uh, first, uh, I would like to ask, what has been your highlight in, uh, in your career since uh, when you were appointed? Uh, thank you. Uh, the viewers, I think going direct to the question, I am the CEC member, meaning Count Executive Committee member in charge of education and ICT in the government of Cliff County. This is a, a new appointment and my responsibility is a delegated responsibility where I work on behalf of the governor to see that the quality of education in the county is improved. The key mandates or the pillars under which this department is anchored is mainly to look at the early childhood education, the pre-primary education, and the other pillar is the vocational training and finally, the third pillar is the information communication technology. But that's not, only, that's not the only function the department is also undertaking, because at the same time, I'm doubling up uh, as a waziri, and at the same time, I'm serving the county as the chair of the Cliff County Education Board. So I extend also uh, to serve in the mandate as the chair of the education count, uh, the, the chair of the Cliff County Education Board, also to see that the quality of education at primary or the basic education in, uh, at large, that is primary and second school, is also improved. And in that context, the county has introduced a scholarship program. We call it the Cliff County Ward Scholarship Fund, which is basically uh, established so that it can support bright students who do very well in their national examinations, but may be challenged in terms of the economic capacity to be able to transit to the other levels of education. So the county has so far uh, invested 350 million. So that is one aspect which we have already been addressing as a department to look at the law so that uh, we can moderate this program of sponsoring uh, candidates or students from Kilifi County who have made it in the exams for them to be able to move on to the advanced levels. Uh, not only that, in terms of the, the mandate of the department, say the pre-primary education, we are uplifting our facilities so that we are able to have the enrollment of the early learners, that means the early childhood education kids are uh, increased so that uh, the child of Kilifi is prepared right from the early years to learn in an environment that prepares them to pursue the primary education, the second education at ease. The vocational training is also another pillar that I've mentioned, and we're also projecting that we, may, we shall be coming up with something which is an incubation or business incubation center, and hopefully a limb center will be a pivot point for us to make these kind of discussions so that uh, we're able to help uh, 
those students or the graduates of the vocational training centers that we have in Kilifi County to come up with uh, business plans, uh, right proposals or business plans that can be able to win startup funds so that they can actually prudently do their businesses and seek their space of the job market in Kilifi or even anywhere else in the country or even abroad. For the ICT, we are looking at ways of uh, improving service provision in the county in a way of uh, uh, adapting or embracing ICT in all the uh, service sectors. And more to look at the opportunity for the employability of the youth in order uh, through the use of ICT. So basically, I think those are the key highlights that I would uh, uh, point out at this point as far as uh, my appointment is concerned and the responsibilities that I'm holding as the CC member in charge of education and ICT. Okay, thank you. Uh, you have mentioned uh, about the ICT and the funds for helping the, the students, both the, 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 uh, the bright students uh, to continue their education yes. and also the uh, employing the youths, yes. and we'll come back to that. But uh, first, uh, you all know that uh, the new syllabus was introduced. Eh? Yes. Uh, okay. Now, for Kilifi County to adopt, yeah, to adopt the the new syllabus that was introduced uh, yes. by the National Government Ministry of Education, how how are you trying to to make people stick to to make it uh, happen? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. That indeed, um, the education sector has been very dynamic in terms of uh, realigning itself to address real social issues. And uh, that can only be achieved if we are able to build in competences in our learners that as they go through the education system, they can come out and either they have skills or they have the competence to address social problems or even position themselves economically. So, we, we know, yes, we have the new curriculum that was proposed and the, the country now is gearing the curriculum in seven competencies. Not even to highlight all of them, but as you know, there is the concept of learning to learn, there's the concept of collaboration and cooperation, and the, the socialization, and the idea that our youth are able to acquire competencies through this curriculum, so that those who are either uh, talented to pursue academic pursuit, to become researchers, to become professors, those ones can follow that path. But we also know that there are those who are talented, but so far we have had talents which die off in the villages without them being, being highlighted to even come to become like world stars or people who can actually earn their living through their talents. The other pillar is the vocational one, the vocational training, and, and this is one of the th levels that can actually help push the economy of the, of the nation. So we have the technocrats, but we have also people who have got skills that can address specific issues that can solve many problems that we have. So if you, from this context, the Department of Education at the national level is divided to have the Department of Basic Education, but we have also the Department of Vocational Training, and we have the Department of University and Research. So that we can actually, through that spectrum, we can be able to address uh, the various issues from early learning. So coming to the question as how the county is realigning itself towards this new curriculum. We have had opportunities where we have taken our directors, or I've not mentioned this before, but I think I want to highlight this. Under my department, I've got three directors. Uh, one director is for the pre-primary education, the other director is for the vocational training, and the other director is for ICT. So when the curriculum came, the director for pre-primary uh, pre education, uh, they were called to go to the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development, and we were given some training in order for them to come down to the ground and nominate or get some teachers who have also been put in some training so that they, can, they are aware on the methodologies of to how to can implement this, uh, this new curriculum. And that has been done. And what is remaining now is for us to align the learning environment, meaning the, the physical facilities, the academic uh, uh, environment, 
and the socioeconomic environment where the children will be exposed to. So the digital literacy, we are looking at how we can equip our schools with the digital facilities so that teachers are able to adapt, uh, let's say, the e-books that I've seen at this center, uh, exposing our kids to early learning, for example, uh, if we have television sets in our pre-primary schools, and uh, the pre-primary schools, so that kids can also see how uh, the so cartoon training, uh, color identification, public speaking, socialization, this kind of uh, competency that can be built from that early age, either by exposure or uh, by training through the teaching. So that is now the, the kind of a, a I mean, sort of efforts that we have already put in place the training of teachers who have become train, uh, trainers, the so-called TOTs. Uh, trainer, we have trained trainers of, uh, yes, so T TOTs. So in order for us to be able to disseminate these competencies to a wider range of the teachers we have. So we are looking at the competence of the teachers. We are looking at the learning environment and looking at the infrastructure so that we are able to make an ideal situation that can actually embrace all these competences that the new curriculum wants. Thank you. Um, at the county, it has a few number of uh, technical, vocational, educational uh, training institutions. Uh, what will happen to the students who don't qualify to go to high schools? Okay, that's a good question, but I wouldn't want to stigmatize the candidates who come to this vocational training to mean that it will only be those who have failed to uh, achieve other training. I would want to make it open such that if, even by choice, somebody who is very smart, they are excellent uh, intellectually, but they choose to go for the vocational training because that's the, the, a line they can pursue. They also have an opportunity to pursue that line to the, the maximum uh, qualification they can have. So indeed, at the moment we have 26 uh, vocational training centers and we are in the process of uh, uh, coming up with more centers, but it's not only coming up the, with the centers, but also identifying the causes that are relevant for us to impart skills in so that those graduates of these centers can get opportunities to either establish their own businesses or look, get jobs uh, by some potential employers. So what uh, we are doing as a department we're enhancing the facilities and programs that we have in these vocational centers. It may not be the issue of the number, but if we have very well elaborate and expanded uh, training, uh, vocational training centers that are training a diversity of programs, and with the facilities, say accommodation, or the facilities like in terms of the equipment that we have, we may be able to have colleges or training centers that can accommodate even up to 1,000. Uh, students. So these, 200, these 26, uh, if we're able to admit 1,000 in each of them, we are talking about a population of 26,000. So it, it may not be the issue of distributing so many micro or small centers with very uh, poor infrastructure, but facilities that can have a state-of-the-art facilities plus instructors who are able to train in those diverse kind of uh, uh, competencies. But not only that, uh, the department is also planning to hold some kind of consultative workshop with employers, potential employers. So we don't just want to train graduates for the sake of training in skills that people may not even have an opportunity to get a job. But we are going to call upon, say, if in Malindi we have one factory, we have the airport, we have uh, Mombasa cement, we have Centum, we have Mabat rolling, and all those factor, I mean, companies that can absorb our graduates. So what we want to do is to have a, con a consultative session where we shall ask them, we are training for some competencies and vocational training centers. What is it that you would want us to train so that you can be able to absorb? The idea is for us to inform ourselves about the opportunities in the job market so that when we train in the vocational training centers, we don't train for the sake of it, but we are training graduates who, when they come out, they are able to find jobs because the, the job market is ready for them. So uh, I should also mention here 
that I've said that it's not only the ones who fail, <laughs> but those ones who can also choose vocational training as a competence they want. Because remember, in this county, we have also the government institution, the technical institutes. We have Weru, we have the Godoma Technical Institute, and we have another one in Kaloleni. And these ones are, are training also at national level. We also have in this region the Technical University of Mombasa. So you would imagine that we want to get a graduate who, starting from certificate level, can move on to do a diploma and they can move on to do a degree. So our curriculum will be so uh, structured that any competence you acquire at whatever level of vocational training, you are able to move on up to a degree level. So it's not going to be only exclusively those who make, don't make it, but it is going to be open to people who also can come to add value in the training by choice. Now we are having a population of where that 5% of the people in Malindi or in Kilifi yeah. County who are illiterate. Yeah. Now in the case of TV, TVET, TVET. Uh, TVET, how are we going to improve it to ensure that it becomes effective in the community in order to reduce this percentage? Okay, that's a good question because you are saying if we talk about youth, then who are these youth? Uh, is it the youth who are in formal uh, institutions like schools? Or do you have even those youth who are 18 years but they have become adults because they are married and they have wives and children? Yeah? But they are still youth in terms of the chronological age. So the question you are uh, asking is what do we do to these people who may not have had the opportunity to pursue their education, yet they have responsibilities, and we have these opportunities, the vocational training centers, for them to be able to learn some competencies. One of the things that I see immediately is if these people are still at the age and are willing to come back to school, my emphasis is to carry out a program operation to go back to school so that we can actually uh, train them and we open up opportunities for them to actually access education. You know there is programs where people even learn at adult, uh, adult age, so there's the adult education. Uh, we've seen people who are doing business at the market, they are market people, they are doing business at the marketplaces, but they also acquire, require skills like entrepreneurial skills, business skills. So these are people that we can, uh, we're going to introduce some kind of a, an adult education program where they get the level of literacy that can enable them access the knowledge in the vocational training centers and introduce courses that are tailor-made that we don't want to keep somebody for a whole term without them doing their business. But if they can afford one hour, so a part-time kind of program, one hour to come for those lessons and then they go back to their businesses. Just like I want to give an example, the, the border border industry. Many people argue that why don't we bring them back to education? But remember, if you take one hour for that border border, how many clients he has missed? So you have to draw a program that will be, co will be compromising in a way that they've got about two hours, very early in the morning, they come to the learning session, and then you give them about eight hours to go back to their businesses. That way you'll be able to hold them in school. Otherwise, there'll always be this conflict like, okay, I spent two hours in, this, in the training, but then I'm missing several clients. Therefore, at the end of the day, I have nothing to give to the owner of the motorbike. So this is the kind of thing that we have as, as a department, that uh, we also collaborate with the Department of Social uh, Services, Agenda, and Youth Programs, so that we're able to embrace programs that can actually address specifically these adult learners. So, so, so uh, at first you said you are in charge of the ICT. Yeah? Yes, yes. So, but we'll come back to, you. Uh, to, to our guest, uh, to our MC here. Uh, you know that we are in a digitalized uh, world, yeah? And uh, what are you trying to do in uh, Rabai? I mean, uh, Mwawesa. What are you trying to do uh, to make that uh, the schools to be digitalized? For example, you see in a Limu Resource Center, we have the computers where people can go and uh, watch the, 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 the plays. Uh, and uh, we also have the word readers. So what are you doing uh, there? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, viewers. My name is uh, Carol Kalume, elected MCA for Mawesa Award. Now, today I'm very much privileged to accompany the CC member for education for this uh, interview and also for the benchmarking. Elimu Resource Center, we have been privileged to, uh, to see the facilities that are here. 
one of my uh, my ambition is to come up with such a center in uh, Rabai Sub County because we do not have one. We want to introduce the culture of reading, not only in Rabai but uh, the larger Kilifi County. And uh, ours, as you know, as a legislature, is to uh, I, I mean to, to I mean to legislate to, to, to legislate to oversee and also to to represent the community. So I am very much impressed with this facility and I would uh, really love the same to be introduced in the, the various wards and also in the Bay Sub County. So uh, back to you, uh, Mashimia. Yeah. Uh, what about the, the e-learnings? We have uh, the e-learnings in the, in the syllabus, yeah? Yeah. So there are some schools that uh, don't have the, the projectors that, so that they may look for their practicals, you see, you can also watch, yeah? So what are you trying to do? Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's very true. And what we've just been trying to uh, do is to look at the opportunities that we already have. For example, we have a, the public libraries. There are places, if I just give as an example, in Cliff South, we have a, a library at Zitzoni, and this library has, oh, the e-books, it has quite a number of digitalized uh, reading material. And uh, we, we've been going to sessions like this to really have these people in information, I mean, the information uh, science, to be able to also articulate and sensitize the community. That, uh, for example, here at the Elim Center, I see today many students who have been able to come. You are able to spend time here to, uh, to read and uh, access the books. So if we have a center like the, uh, the library at Zitoni, uh, where we already have e-books, but what I realize is that it, out there we don't have the information. So one of the steps that we are going to we are undertaking as a, a department is to organize with us with those entities that we carry out a sensitization uh, mission to go out to tell the youth and the students during their holidays that we were putting where they used to be called academic clinics. But I did not know what academic clinics were doing if they don't clean and provide this information uh, that is very relevant for the kids. So what we are saying, when we put those uh, camps, we are going to be passing this information and we are holding these sessions, particularly in the environment, like uh, for many of the schools in Cliff, in Cliff South, we invite them at the, at the library and we're able to take them through practically and, and draw a program where during the holidays they are able to come and use this facility. But it's not only that. If the teachers who are teaching around that area are not also aware that the, that library facility exists, so we're also putting the information level to alert our teachers that, look, don't sit here crying that you don't have a projector, crying that you don't, access, you don't have an e-book. Go to the library. So if in a week, in the timetable, we draw a program where if the Form 4s or Form 4 and 3 are going to the library and they're able to access the books, that be the kind of opportunity that we create because we are using the facility that already exists. In the meantime, we are also projecting. In fact, at the Mushimuakaro here, we've been discussing about the kind of project that we should be coming up with. And one of the things was which she already highlighted is to come up with a lake. Then already the people in Mawesa, the second schools, the primary schools can have an opportunity to access the e-learning materials. So this is the kind of projection that we have so that the coming five years uh, in office or for this, the tenure of this current government, we're able to put up at least in each sub-county some kind of a, 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 an information center or a library center where we sensitize the schools to be able to utilize this at the, the student level, but also at the teacher's level. Yeah. Thank you, but uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yes, you have an issue on that. No, no. Yeah. no. Yes. It's very wonderful uh, to construct uh, a library in Mwawesa, it's very good. But uh, there is uh, an alarm, alarming thing but, yes. uh, about the, in school, the people ratio, the people to teacher. Yes. Uh, the recommended one is one is to 40. Yeah. But uh, it's, uh, in schools in Kilifi County, it's alarming, it's one is to 59. What's, yes. uh, what's wrong? Okay, that's not, that's not also, that's not only Kilifi. Remember, this year we were committed to having 100% transition of all the children who are done uh, class eight exams. 
even the ones who are 100 marks, I think the, the, the commitment of the government is nobody should remain at home. And the consequence of that, like Marereni High School, we have uh, from ones who are 538. So far beyond the capacity of the school. So indeed, the student, the student teacher ratio is not only 59, it's almost like going to one to 70. And what, what we were uh, arguing before the operation go, go to school came up with the CS Matiangi, that the concern of the nation was why, why is the government uh, spending money? The government is, is paying for every child 22,244 for tuition. Either you're in day school or in boarding school at se second school level. But uh, the children were at home. So the question was, where are these? That's why there was a, a whole mobilization involving the local administration, the chiefs, and the Wazewa Kijiji, Balozi, Nyumbakumi, and everybody, so that children could go to school. But consequently, the numbers went up. So this ratio, of course, created this constraint. So, but when we were doing this, the government was very much aware, and the argument was, create the need first, and then now we can respond to the need. So don't tell me to send teachers uh, in a school where you have only 24 kids, and you're telling me to send five teachers. So you'll find that the teacher-student ratio, five against 24, you can divide. It will be one to, to, to five, okay? So the pressure was, create the need first. And now we are addressing the issue. We have more children in high schools, the numbers have swollen, so the TSC has to respond commensurately to be able to, uh, to address the issue of the student-teacher ratio. But that demand had to be created. Otherwise, TSC could not send teachers, yet in the schools we, we had no students. So it, it, it was not easy. It was almost like a national operation. And the Khalifi, at least we managed to get 110% enrollment this time. Now, in the case where, oh, what are the plans for the ministry? Or what are things that the ministry are planning so that they can ensure that disabled people are in school, they are educated, and in terms of the library, they can access the library easily? Okay, that is a, a very good question because it borders on what we call social protection. Uh, social protection is like the the members of the community that are living with disability, what amenities have we put in place in order for them to be able to access education like anybody else? And the commitment of our department, and as I said earlier, we actually collaborate in three departments. The Department of Education and ICT, the Department of the Social, uh, social Service, Gender, Social, yeah, and Social Services, and then the Department of Health. Because also, uh, when you have persons with disabilities, you have to be offering health services like uh, physiotherapy and uh, um, okay, all the time is carrying out some clinics so that you are putting these people up to the some, for example, the ones who are suffering from cerebral palsy. So you have to be constantly around for them. So the department uh, is already planning, first of all, in the schools that exist, for us to create the so-called inclusive environment meaning we're going to put adaptive facilities so that the persons with disability are able to also access. Maybe just to ask uh, a limb center uh, whether you have ramps so that uh, the person with disability or people on wheelchairs are able to access the building because if that is not the case, then it means you are an exclusive environment. So one of the steps uh, uh, to undertake in all the schools is to ensure that they become as in inclusive as possible. So that is only on the physical uh, uh, handicap or physical challenge people. But also, the ones who are also visually impaired, uh, we have seen a lot of digital facilities here. And one of the things I would recommend and what we are also going to do in our schools is uh, to put uh, computers which also put the digital uh, software for persons who are visually impaired. For example, the JAWS software, J-A-W-S, which is like a software that talks to the blind person. So as they are typing, if it's katana, you say ka a ta a n a So you can be typing while you are blind and you are, you are, you are not able to see, but 
the, the computer will be talking or will be saying the letters so that you're able to actually type your, your, your message. And that way also the blind people can send emails, they can, uh, they can uh, use any facility which is digitalized. So the digital platform will also help us to get the adaptive facilities. Again, in those schools we want also to acquire facilities like the, other than the software for the blind, which can actually be used to translate the normal English text, to translate into the braille, and we get the braille to the degree of the user. If I use the braille of certain degree, I can actually print it on an embosser, and I have the braille paper. So brailing of the material is also one of the steps that we're going to be taking. Uh, for the hearing impaired people, I've even uh, gone to Huduma centers, and I was asking them, you are Huduma centers, but where is the desk which is at, uh, attending the people with disabilities? Where is the sign language interpreter? So we would be thinking that in our schools, depending on the establishment, because remember, I'll not be able to put a, a, a sign language interpreter in every ECD center, but at least specialized centers, like we have in the county, 35 model schools. So by extension, we shall extend these facilities so that they can have a wing that can actually be addressing the issues, specific issues with the person with disability. So uh, sign language interpreters, who will be a, 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 a sort of attached to the schools, those model centers, so that we are able to say, if you're a person with this kind of handicap, you can be, uh, you can be served well if you go to this kind of school. And uh, so we are, we are moving towards that, uh, coming up with an inclusive environment in our, our model centers, uh, providing for the facilities, um, uh, mobility is something, but I don't know, this will come much later. Because uh, I would imagine uh, we have done this at universities. Like uh, if you go to Kenyatta University, they've got welfare buses. We have had tuk-tuks. In fact, I'm always pride, proud about this. I'm the first person to buy tuk-tuks in this country. But when I bought a tuk-tuk, I bought two units from Gutika Agents in Nairobi. And I was buying those tuk-tuks to aid the mobility of students with disability at Kenyatta University. But then later, tuk-tuks came and now they've become commercial facilities. Okay? But this is the thinking that we, we really collaborate to come up with an inclusive environment and adapt programs which are called CBR, the Community-Based Rehabilitation Programs. Um, as you have said, uh, the number of uh, students in high schools, it has increased. But then, uh, the high schools in the county have recorded a higher enrollment of males than females. Mm, why is this? And are there measures to ease this solution? Okay, maybe I'll, I'll start then, Madam Caro, because you have mentioned what uh, the representation of the lower number represents, Madam uh, Mwishimua Caro here. So uh, she'll answer as to what has happened to the girls. But uh, you know, the transition. We, we had some statistics where we could get the population of students right from primary school, you find that girls can even be more than the boys. But that as they transcend to secondary school, you start seeing the differentials, that the girls are somehow disappearing. And by th the time we come to college, uh, we, we have that uh, very low representation in terms of the girls transcending to the, other, to the higher levels. And one of the things is uh, the challenges that the girls the girl child has. So we already have started a program to address the issue of teenage pregnancies, which actually is one of the very uh, serious problems that has always been knocking girls out of uh, the school system. You can imagine in Kilifi, we have uh, students in primary school that are of the age 18 and above. In fact, last year, the number of students who are of the age 18 and above from 20 to, uh, to 24, there were 2,000 in Cliff County. And a similar number was found also in Kwali. But you can imagine these older students, they'll always be boys. Because the girl of 18 surviving to 21, by that time, they'll, always be, or they'll already be mothers and they'll be out of school. So the decay rate, or I don't call it decay rate, but the exit rate, of girls due to these uh, calamities or calam calamities of uh, uh, getting pregnant or the so-called teenage pre pregnancies has become one of the serious problems. And we, the, the Department of Education and the Department of Health, we are addressing this issue. 
to sensitize girls at the schools so that they are able to go to, they have a very good knowledge, the so-called productive health uh, education, so that they are able to take responsibility. The problem has been the approach has always classified girls as culprits. That when they become uh, pregnant, they are saying, wametundik wamimba. Somebody has done it upon them. But they have never been seen as people who voluntarily or actively have participated in this. So we have to start approaching the problem by making the girls feel a responsibility, not to look at the same, themselves as victims all the time. Because if we take the victim approach, then somebody must be the criminal. And we're always chasing the criminal, yet the girl is also part of the, the problem. So if this is the approach that we're putting so that we're able to sensitize our girls to really keep uh, in touch and be careful and be aware of themselves because at the end of the day, they're the ones who are left out. Yet yeah, the boys will be moving on. Maybe Madam Caro has something to do. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to appreciate the national government and uh, especially His Excellency, the President, Uhuru Kenyatta, in introducing the free sanitary towels to all schools. And uh, this, I'm sure, it will be able to curb and it will be able to control some of the low attendance of the girl child in, the, in, in schools. And also, like in Kilifi, the issue of uh, the uh, teenage pregnancy and the lack of sanitary towels has been a major, major problem. This, this has been a cause of the uh, poor attendance of the girl child in schools. And uh, as a legislature, I'll make sure I advocate for this so that our girls we are able to control them, we are able to support them, to give them the motivation and the support to be able to go back school, to school fully, be, to be able to have enough of the sanitary towels, and also come up with stringent actions to the persons who impregnate our girls, and, uh, and also the girls who become pregnant after giving birth, we make sure that they come back to school and continue with their studies. So I'm sure the, the the level of their coming back to school will rise very very soon. Yeah, but, but, but then. First, but I have a question. I have a question. Yes. You, uh, the bo both of you being uh, legislators, uh, both of you talking about girls. Where's the boy child? You know, you're talking as if uh, the boy child generation is now trying to be a marginalized group, and uh, we see uh, the enrollment in school. Uh, the, uh, in total. The gross enrollment is 42.5 percent, but the net enrollment is 34.5 or 35 percent, which means that uh, about 8.5 or 8 percent dropped out of school. But uh, in the 8.5 percent, there are both boys and girls. What about the boys? You can see that boys drop out of school. Uh, some in, indulge in crime, drugs. What are you trying to do to help the boy child? Instead, now. Uh, focusing, uh, concentrating a lot on the girls? Okay, I think it's not an issue of concentrating a lot of the girls. We are responding to the question as to why uh, the girl, the, the, if you look at the statistics, the girl child seems like as they exit, transcend from, uh, transit from one level to the other. You can start at a level where you have 50-50, but as they move to higher levels of education, it seems like the boy child now come, becomes dom dominant than the girl, the girl child. But that does not mean that the boy child is not also challenged. The socioeconomic challenges that we face in our families, they affect both the, 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 the girl child and the boy child. They are the so-called uh, child labor. Uh, there are many families that uh, would say, instead of you going to school, uh, if you are a boy, go ride the border border and bring in Fuko Waunga in the evening. Yeah? And if you are a girl, go to Magorani, where there is a, there's a kind of a activity there. You, you end up from Jengo, you lift some karais of Kokoto and get something for the t table. So, in as much as <laughs> globally, all the time when we talked about uh, uh, representation, there was an obvious uh, impact on the negative, uh, which was negatively uh, influencing the girl child's uh, opportunities to move on in education. Until now, the song was, "What do we do with the, boy, the girl child?" Until later, now we have realized, okay, as we talk more, the girl child. Uh, I think now the boy child is also getting extinct. <laughs> uh, I think we have just balance. 
And for me, it is more addressing this socioeconomic uh, environment, where if for both, my prayer is I would want to see the girls also riding the motorbike so that they don't become dependent. Because a boy is riding the motorbike, he gets 100 shillings, uh, the, the, the girl does not have 100 shillings, so we, uh, when a 100 shilling looks some dos, because at least he's 100 uh, shillings worth higher than the girl. Yeah? So, but if these two people could also have an equal opportunity to ride the motorbikes, each one of them will be making 100. So girls, I think uh, let us not hide. Let's come out and uh, pursue what the boys feel like this is for them alone. Um, I'd say so, that uh, there are equal opportunities for both the girl child and the boy child uh, in schools. So um, on to our next question. Um, what is the ministry doing um, yeah. to upbring talents in schools? Uh, motivational talks. In a limo center, we normally have motivational talks whereby students come uh, over here, they are uh, mot motivated uh, to go back to school to pursue uh, their careers. But then we don't see the ministry uh, coming in into our locations and giving motivational talks to students and also to youths. Okay, I can assure you we have started. Indeed, you have never seen the ministry, but today you have the ministry in house. And not only the ministry, but you also have our legislator here. So the two arms of government, the Cliff County government, has heard very well the concerns about what is it that we have to undertake and creating laws at, at the county assembly, which will enable me as an executive to be able to implement programs that will promote talents and that will promote uh, the so-called the skill skills training, so that uh, our youth can actually increase their horizon for for job opportunities. So rest assured that any time now you invite us to Elim Center, we shall be here yesterday. Okay. <laughs> now statistics show that 48.5 percent of children under the age of five have got standard growth. Yeah. Now, how are they being assisted by the county once they join the ECD schools? Okay, I would first of all say I want to really feel very proud of my county for having been among the first seven counties nationwide to adapt the school milk program. We have 47 counties and recently we had a, uh, a conference of, from, which was organized by the Kenya Dairy Board and Tetra Park. Mm -hmm. And this is something that has really been at national, at nationwide has been addressing the issue of uh, helping stunted kids or coming up with health children in our schools. So when the milk program came up, Mombasa County, as County 001, and Kilifi County, County 003, were among the first to adapt and embrace the school feeding program, I mean the school milk program. Uh, we already started with an investment of 50 million and we, we started distributing milk to our, to our schools. This was launched in uh, November, around November 2016 and that program has been going on. We are now even in the process of increasing our stock, so we, are, we have already done the, uh, the procurement and we are going to be having milk which will be distributed to our schools. So we are fully coming up with partners, uh, coming up with the programs that will involve the partners either milk processors or even organizations like Tetra Park which are international organizations to come up, with, we come up with formulas or formulae where other than the milk alone you can combine like for, we know that in Kenya we love porridge. But in Nigeria, they love uh, something, I don't know what kind of stuff they eat there, fufu, uh, yeah? So what they've done is like to combine the milk and the, and, and the fufu to make a formula that is so uh, nutritious for the early ch learners or the children. And in Kenya, we can also adapt that program because we, we have porridge in our schools, but we also have milk. So we, these are programs that we are thinking that we could discuss with the processors so that we have a very cheap formula that can be made to combine uh, the flour, the maize flour plus the milk so that our children can have a balanced diet, a very nutritious uh, packages that can now be given. But as per now, Kilifi County 
we already have the milk program, the school milk program, and this is going to continue so that we can address this issue of uh, stunted children. But then, um, that milk program, it goes for other ECB learners. Alanas. When you go to our high schools, uh, what inputs does the county give to the government boarding schools to ensure balanced uh. nutrition? We know that uh, in high schools, uh, some of, uh, most of the balanced diet, most of the food, it's not, they don't take a balanced diet. So, what is the ministry doing about that? Okay, this is a... Uh something very interesting that, okay, we thought we, we, if we address the problem from the early learners, yeah, so our intervention will be uh, felt at uh, the levels when these uh, kids come to secondary school. You may all know, or you, as you know, we have, in the devolved system of government, government, we have uh, devolved functions. As I said, if you remember, I said the Department of Education and ICT at Cliff County is early learning, vocational, and uh, the ICT. But remember, I'm doubling up because I'm the chair of the, uh, of, of the county education board, which is a national government uh, uh, component. So the issue of coming up with the balanced diet at second school level is not really directly under the mandate of the, the, uh, the count governments, uh, countrywide. But it's something that through the so-called social protection program, because we are talking about, uh, like if uh, we don't have, with this drought, we have food shortage in the country, you have seen the county government going out there and providing uh, food or assisting those affected families. The Department of Gender, Social Services, is the department of the county government, which is positioned to work out programs that are able to address even uh, this kind of programs we have at high schools. No, now, for example, the national government has said uh, for the high school children, you are going to be paying 500 uh, shillings and you'll be given free, free health programs. So they're telling into those pillars of the national government and the, our departments of social services, this is something that can be worked out. But it will not fall directly, so to say, under the Minister of Education. I'll be assisting in terms of thought because as they put the high school children into programs where they can also be healthy, what I'll be doing here will be continued. At the end see, of the day, it is the grade that you come out with, not the fact that you enjoyed your time working three, three, three minutes, you are in school, and come out with a D. Yeah? So, so we, we, it's the balance. But it, it doesn't mean that I don't appreciate the fact that there is the general board fatigue if you are able to walk, uh, to, uh, to walk into long distance. I think the projection with the national government and through the, uh, the members of parliament is for them to, through the, the CDF funds, to create opportunities where we can have schools in very close range. But not so many until now the teacher-student teacher ratio uh, becomes challenged because you have so many schools, yet we have not addressed the issue of do we have enough personnel. So you get about five schools here, you got only five schools in one school, so the deputy head teacher goes to that school to become the head, you transfer another one, so we get challenged in terms of staffing. Okay, okay. okay. So do you think that uh, your, uh, in your ministry, we need to be able to provide for these schools uh, and give them support in the next uh, coming years? Which schools? High schools. The high schools. Well, at that, at, at that department of, uh, of education at the count level, one of the aspects we have already undertaken is the, let me call it the philanthropic component, where we are already supporting those who have performed well and they are able to move on to higher education. And the commitment, and I'm happy that uh, my MCA is here because we are doing the law, and the law is such that is going to support that any child who accesses the scholarship of the Cliff County Ward Scholarship Fund will be supported for the four years of in school. That is from Form 1 to Form 4 or possibly at higher, for the higher education, meaning at university level, we are also thinking of creating a fund where the students at the university level will access in form of a loan system, which can be managed either by the higher education loans board, but it will be benefiting the student from Cliffy County. So at the lower levels, the World Scholarship Fund, which will support the student up to form four, at least through the education, and at university level, at a component of a loan, which will be allocated by the county in terms of the amount of money but to be accessed by the uh, For me, 
I'm very ambitious. I, I, I don't want to suffer from, uh, there's a, a syndrome, we as coastal people, we call it the Angalao syndrome. <laughs> okay, the Angalao syndrome is, is, is uh, targeting the minimum. Eh? Nikipata 2D, I'm okay. You know? uh, if I get a D plus, it's, it's all right. We don't perform, sit on a jarib. You, you don't say that they have done so well, we say, ah, I think we have to get out of our mindset that if the scale of performance is from E to, to A, and A is excellent, and I'm sure if you go to so many uh, schools and you look at the school motto, everybody is striving for excellence. So we should now help our schools or as a department, we are going to go around. Tomorrow we shall be in Rabai, and we are calling upon our teachers. Please let us know what we do, what we call dynamic targeting. That because this group last year, for the form fours of last year gave us an average of C plus, the next group is going to give us a B minus. I think the targeting should be a norm. If we are coming to Elim Center, this is a center for excellence. When I walk here, I should walk an A. If I get out of the gate, I'm getting out as an A. Even the watchman I meet at the gate, opening the, the way they open the gate, they open as an A. The reception is down there, should be A people. So our target as Kilifi County is targeting an A, not an Angalao thing. So that if we can set ourselves, for, for us not to get an A should be just a consequence we can explain. Maybe Manafunza Alkwam Gonjwa or somebody was not feeling well. But our commitment, and I hope all of us who are reading here, you are not reading here to look like if I get out with a B, I'll be okay, or if I get a D, I'm okay. I hope all of us in this room, we are reading to get A's. Nothing less, nothing more. Yeah. Then if you get a B, let it be a consequence we can explain. But all the students in Kilifi County, can we target next year and the next coming year that Kilifi is going to be among the top three uh, counties in this in, in this nation. Okay, for uh, there's a quick fire question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Are you are you prepared? Yes. Yeah, are you too prepared? <laughs> no, me, I'm not prepared. Well, she's not prepared. I am. Prepared. <laughs> so, uh, which school uh, did you attend in high school? I, I attended Ribe, Ribe 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 Boys. That time it was RSS. It was not Ribe Boys. It was Ribe Second School. Uh, and what was your best subject? My best subject was physical science. I got a, a credit three. And. Yeah, go ahead. What, what, uh, what was your best game? Were My best game was, or yes, I was, I, I was in basketball and I was also at a school, an, an actor. Okay. <laughs> but I can tell you more. <laughs> if you ask him. Yes, because you said what was the best. Um, you should ask you, you are a professor. What are you a professor of? Uh, yeah, yeah. I am a professor of physics. Okay. okay? And, and uh, I, 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 so I'm a professor of physics and by virtue of my studies, I went to study in Germany and therefore I had to do German language and also I'm a lecturer of German language which there's no teacher. And can you remember your best uh, teacher? My best teacher? Yes. Yeah, my best teacher was myself. <laughs> yes. I was driven, I was self, I, I, was, I was driven to learn myself. The teacher was an enabler, but I became the teacher. Okay? So. I will comment. Uh, thank you, Shun. <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, as we wind up, just one question from the floor. We had a student earlier on uh, who asked about the student's leadership. Um, how are you coming up with an idea so that at least you meet these students one, once in a year, the student's leadership? OK. Me, I would be very open because we are talking about leadership and therefore I'm assuming there's also self-organization. Meaning, as they call themselves student leaders, there is an aspect of self-organization that one day they can plan and if they plan so that they're able, they want to meet me, I'll always be free, I'll be open to come and meet them anytime. But I would want it to be initiated from the leadership itself. But what my assurance is that I'm open and any time or we want to have an interactive session because I was also a student leader. I was, that, those days I was called, I was a prefect first at Form 4, then I became a captain. Uh, but I've also been a president of some, some kind of thing. So we can come and talk about student leadership. Okay. What can you tell the young people now? Okay, what can I tell the young people? Okay, young means they're from 18 downwards. Okay. 
So young people, the future belongs to those who plan for it. Okay? The future belongs to those who plan for it. And if you want to make your future, if you want to predict your future, make it now. Meaning, if you want to get an A grade, make it now in this room. So as you are reading, remember the future, you are planning for the future, and the future will belong to those who will be planning for it. And for you to predict it, make it now. So if you are predicting an A, the A should be made now. And that is the, curry, the, the message I give you. And one thing, believe in yourself because all can do it. Because I made it and you can also do it.